I started writing this back in January, so pretty much all of my jokes in this opening are completely irrelevant, and I had to start over again. Take whatever this is, and let's get the show back on the road. We live in interesting times for the Evercade. The original models are discontinued, more cartridges are going out of print, I still can't meet a deadline to save my shit. There are giga cartridges coming out, the Evercade is emulating PS1 games, it's crazy. Now that there's a $100 version coming out, I kinda wanna get my hands on that Evercade EXP, however you pronounce it. The color scheme isn't fantastic, but if I can save a third of the cost without the Capcom games, I'm fine with that. But for right now, let's talk about Atari, specifically the second Atari cart. When it comes to Atari, it's fair to say I don't have much nostalgia for them, or any nostalgia for that matter. What can I say? I was born in 1989, and my first gaming system was the Game Boy, the original, the kind that can take an IED blast and still work perfectly fine. So I view the Atari carts as being for two types of people. Either you're buying them for the nostalgia, in which case all you need to know is how well they run, or you're buying the carts because you own the system, and why not add to that collection? By the way, all of the Atari games run fine on the Evercade, and they should. They were built for a system with 4 kilobytes of memory. As usual, I'll be giving these a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Enjoy. Number 1. Air Sea Battle. I love the Atari 2600 advertising style of 21 games in one. What a bargain. Air Sea Battle is one of those games I started recording video for thinking, okay, I'll get a couple minutes of this and suffer through it and then do my write-up about how it's barely playable by today's standards. And then the CPU beat me and it kicked into gear that competitive part of my brain. So of course I had to go through each of the modes and whoop the CPU's ass. And it was close. There is no AI in this game. There are 27 modes that are variations of the same 6 or so actual activities, and each game includes a single player mode where the CPU just holds down the fire button and never moves or changes angle. It's proof of how far you can get an air sea battle employing absolutely no strategy. Or maybe that's just one of the better strategies. Every match lasts 2 minutes and 16 seconds exactly. That's important to know for absolutely no reason. And I'm not making it dig at the game over its AI. Again, they had 4 kilobytes on the card to work with. My verdict? I'm going to say thumbs down for both systems. Assuming you can get a friend to play with you on the verses, they won't be your friend for long. Number 2. Asteroids. It sure is Asteroids, alright. This is the 7800 version, meaning it's somewhere between the 2800 version and the arcade version. But at the end of the day, it's still Asteroids, and there's nothing wrong with that. I said the same thing in my review of the 2600 version on the first Atari cart, and I'll say the same thing here. I wish Evercade would come out with a joystick for the Versus. I tried a couple of options, and the only thing I learned is that the C64 Mini joystick really does suck. But other than that, what can you say about Asteroid 7800? Other than that, I give it a thumbs up on both systems. Number 3. Basketball. Basketball is the funniest game I've played on the Evercade by a long shot, and I've played Ninja Golf. This game has taught me a lot about street basketball. Particularly, I learned the value of kicking the crap out of your opponent as a winning strategy. Seriously, it's actually mentioned in the manual before they talk about the basketball stuff. The basketball part of this game is absolute dog ass. The shooting mechanics have seemingly no rhyme or reason behind them, or strategy on how to figure out your shots and actually shoot them. On the other hand, I could just beat my opponent unconscious and then spend the rest of the game just dunking the ball on them. We thought the Mario Party ruined friendships and family ties. Imagine how angry your little brother would be after you just decked him unconscious and all he can do is watch while you free throw his ass to a 300 nil defeat. Do I recommend it? As a fair game? No. But if you ever need to let off some steam, it's worth a hearty chuckle. Thumbs up. Number 4. Bowling. This is a bowling game and that's all I have to say about it. Bowling on the Atari 2600 is bowling and it's on the Atari 2600. There are three game modes that dictate how the ball rolls after you throw it, and each of those modes has a single player and two player. Honestly, there's not much great I can say about this game, but not much bad I can say about it either. It's like the video game equivalent of a doorstop. It does exactly what it says on the packaging. Nothing more, nothing less. That being said, I'm going to give this a thumbs up on the Evercade and two thumbs up on the Versus. Because if you're going to play this, you might as well get two players while torturing a younger family member about how games used to be in your day. Number 5. Centipede. 
If you want to know my thoughts on Centipede for the 7800, just take my review of Asteroids in the same cart and replace the game title. I love Centipede. It's a quintessential Atari game. And much like Asteroids, it's one of those games that even the pared down version was a reasonable facsimile of the arcade version. And the 7800 version brings us closer to parity with the arcade game. Thumbs up on both handhelds. Number 6, Dark Chambers. Dark Chambers is a test of endurance. It's not a terrible game, it's just not good and the levels cycle around. I wish I had known that earlier, but Dark Chambers is very similar to Gauntlet, and it's not a difficult game in the slightest outside of the sheer determination of mapping out levels and not getting bored. None of the enemies pose a threat, the ground is littered in gold and healing items, and it's truly an early ass RPG. And I didn't half-ass this game for this review. I played through all 26 levels from A to Z blind, and finding out at the end that you get looped around to an earlier level and it all starts over again. Bring your own music, because this game is nearly dead silent. I'm playing the Evercade music behind this just because I need something in the background. Number 7, Demons to Diamonds. Demons to Diamonds is 1. Surprisingly complex for an Atari 2600 game, and 2. Surprisingly complex for a game whose premise is in the title. Just check out the gameplay footage and tell me if you can figure out what the goal of the game is. I'll wait. Actually, I won't. The goal of Demons to Diamonds is to turn demons into diamonds, and you can't turn all the demons into diamonds. The demons have to match the color of your laser, and if you hit them with your laser, they turn into diamonds, and then you hit the diamonds while they're still on the screen for points. And if they don't match, they turn into skulls, which I know from personal experience at my local pawn shop are not considered diamonds, and those skulls try to kill you. Don't hit the mismatched skulls. It's a pretty unique game concept and fun to play for a little bit here and there. There's a two-player mode that could use some good competition if you got someone to play with. I'm going to give this a thumbs up on the Evercade, uh, two thumbs up on the Versus. Number 8, Desert Falcon. Desert Falcon on the 7800 is like the opposite of Asteroids and Centipede. Just because they made the game look better doesn't mean it plays any better. I've seen a lot of positive praise for Desert Falcon on the internet, and I just don't get it. Maybe you had to have been there at the time. I will say, the more I play Desert Falcon on the 7800, the more I think I'm getting it, though. Playing this is like reading a book where the author devised their own language, and just kind of expects the reader to learn it over time. The graphics are better than the 2800 version, obviously, but it's still ridiculously hard to figure out just how high your bird is and what you can and cannot hit. It also doesn't help that enemies rise and fall when they're moving, making the whole thing kind of a perspective mess. Also, it's really stupid in my current era brain that you can sidestep onto an object and immediately die, like my bird casually walks into a pyramid and just breaks his neck. Desert Falcon is probably too complicated for what the Atari games could handle, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and give it a thumbs up on the caveat that it's an acquired taste. Almost everyone who owned this on the Atari as a kid seemed to love it. All six people who bought the Atari 7800. Number 9, Haunted House. My opinion on Haunted House has soured since I played the game for my original Evercade review, and it's because I played the higher levels. Haunted House is a ridiculously complicated game for the Atari 2600, and while creative, it isn't enjoyable. It's also one of those games you need to look up the manual because you'll have no clue what you're doing, and the Evercade manual doesn't help at all. You'll never figure out what the goal is or what you need to do without the manual. The nine game modes represent nine difficulty levels. Your base goal is to roam around the haunted house, collect three pieces of the urn, and escape while avoiding ghosts. In the first mode, the house is well lit. From then on, the house is dark, some doors are locked, but there's a master key which is either in the same spot every time or random. There are more tarantulas chasing you, all five creatures can chase you from room to room. Anytime you are touched by a bat, whatever you're holding gets transported to a random room. Creatures move faster, the ghost isn't affected by the scepter, and the floor plan is different every time. What the hell? It's too much. I predict most people will play this game a couple of times and then get pissed and never touch it again. It's a creative concept, but not a fun game. We see that a lot on the Atari. Thumbs down. Number 10, Human Cannonball. 
There are two types of people who play human cannonball on the Atari 2600. You have the dudes who complain that it's too frustrating to figure out and it's not fun. And then there's the Sigma Chad gamers who whip out their Hello Kitty desk pad and figure out the combination like they're deciphering the Enigma code while guzzling alcoholic waffle batter and eating handfuls of screws like they're potato chips. It's the kind of puzzle that you figure out once and then the mystery is dead. Thumbs down on everything. Number 11, Millipede. Millipede on the Atari 2600 is many things. It isn't fun. It might have had something going for it in a world where you're jonesing for a Millipede game on a handheld system, and at the time they released this, it was your only choice for that. But thankfully for everyone involved, the arcade version can literally be purchased on Evercade's system in the form of the Atari Arcade Collection. I'm not sure who among us actually prefers the Atari version. Don't comment if you're one of those people. Thumbs down. Number 12, Planet Smashers. Another game that I've soured on since my review three years ago. Planet Smashers is annoying, slow, and boring. The sounds are ear grating, and you see pretty much everything the game has to offer in the first three minutes. It's your typical side-scrolling shooter with a bit of a twist. You have a running earth shield that incentivizes you to actually shoot everything instead of merely dodging it, which also makes the game more frustrating by throwing a ton of crap at you at once. It's a game whose value is only in its rarity, and the carts don't go for $200 on eBay because it's so much fun to play. Thumbs down. Number 13, Radar Lock. Radar Lock is an ambitious game and truly for the hardest of hardcore. It doesn't work that good, but when you're playing Radar Lock, it's hard not to be impressed by what they pulled off with this old ass gaming system. And then it gets really frustrating and really difficult. Radar Lock is a faux 3D fighter jet game where you go around the map killing things that look vaguely like planes. The big problem with this game is that it's constantly hard to figure out the placement of everything at any time, which makes things like dodging missiles very difficult. I maintain that even the manual is useless in figuring out how to refuel at the end of the level. This is one of those bonding moments where an older sibling would show the younger one how to do it in return for his fruit roll up the next day. Thumbs down. Number 14, Real Sports Tennis. I was really in a different state of mind reviewing this cart back in 2021. Real Sports Tennis is mediocrity personified. It's a tennis game that bases itself off of hoping the other guy screws up well before you do. The best feature of the game is its really long name board at the start of the match. Otherwise, your characters just pitch the ball back and forth until someone misses it. It's next to impossible to control where your ball goes, and there's no opportunity to set up some really killer tennis moves. Probably more impressive back in 1983. I tried to name myself Venus Burger and it didn't work out. Thumbs down. Number 15, Solaris. Hey everyone, Editor Connor here. I had a whole bit written out for the Solaris part of this review, but I decided not to do it because I'm actually afraid of giving someone in my audience a seizure. Let's just say Solaris is a game that's going to put you in the hospital if you have even a lesser case of epilepsy or other problems with flashing lights. I can't recommend this game for a lot of reasons, and the strobe lights are probably a big part of it. Number 16, Sprint Master. Sprint Master is only playable if you're suffering through it with another person, and even then it's barely playable. An RC racing game that touts 27 games in one, Sprint Master is ridiculously frustrating to control, and if you're playing against the CPU, which I suspect drives perfectly because the Atari doesn't have the processing power to do anything else, the game is completely unplayable. When I die and go to hell, I'm going to be forced to play this game 400 hours a day. Thumbs down. Number 17, Street Racer. Street Racer is a launch era Atari game, meaning it's nigh unplayable by today's standards. It's almost more interesting to consider that people probably used to sit down and play this game for hours. Thumbs down. Number 18, Submarine Commander. Submarine Commander is technically impressive, but otherwise really boring. Again, we see that a lot on the Atari 2600. You're in a submarine looking through the periscope, attacking the same couple of ships that float by every few seconds. From a purely historical point of view, it's another example of the crazy ideas programmers came up with back then. It must have been the drugs, but it hasn't been a fun game since 1985. Thumbs down. Number 19, Wizard. 
Wizard is an interesting game if you're a collector of unreleased Atari titles. This one didn't see the light of day until 2005 and is a prototype developed way back in 1980 by Chris Crawford. It's very clearly a prototype and I'd say most of the value comes from that alone. You play as a wizard fighting against a monster in a labyrinth. With two players on the Evercade Versus, player two can control said monster. It's not very deep and two player mode is ridiculously hard because player two can't even see their character most of the time. Thumbs up for historical purposes, thumbs down for gameplay value. Number 20, Yar's Revenge. Yar's Revenge is the brainchild of Howard Scott Warshaw, a man who receives a $200 kickback every time his game puts someone in the hospital. Yar's Revenge is all about whittling down an enemy shield until you can use yourself as a homing beacon for a big laser that will take them out once and for all. Repeat the same two levels over and over until your migraine is too much to continue playing, and that's Yar's Revenge. It's a pretty simple concept and a relatively fun one to boot. Bonus. Here's a fun little secret that isn't secret at all. If you own both Atari Evercade carts and put them in the verses at the same time, you unlock a 7800 version of Dark Chambers. It's Dark Chambers on the 2800, but better in every conceivable way. That's all I've got for this one. Conclusion. There are 20 games on the second Atari cart, so if you do some complicated math, that comes out to about a dollar per game. The Evercade and Versus are the same in terms of recommendations, and out of 20 titles on the Atari 2 collection, I give 8 of them a thumbs up. If Atari wasn't a demon wearing the skin suit of nostalgia, I'd believe that they put some of these games on for genuine historical value and appreciation for their creators. But I know they really do it because it's cheap and because licensing for these old games is a nightmare. Should you buy the Atari cart? Probably not. It's actually getting really hard to find since the Evercade stopped producing them at the end of 2023. Most of the official stores don't even have them in stock anymore. As far as Atari goes, there are two Lynx cartridges and one Atari cart as of me writing the script. All of these carts are legacy releases and probably won't even be in stock by the time you watch this video. Unfortunately, Atari never releases compilations of their games in any other format, so these are probably all lost to time. Like and subscribe, and I'll see you in 2027 for my next Evercade review. I'm probably going to buy some of the newer carts and then start going backwards, because this whole focus on going in chronological order does not work with my production schedule, and by the time I review most of these carts, they're probably going to be out of print. <laughs>